I don't see any. I see 92 participants. Are they all inside? Yeah, that, that's how many have joined so far. Oh, all right. For a minute. And I just see, um, like three of us, four, five people on, on the block that we're on right now. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have a uh, hundred and some in here right now. Thanks for joining everybody. I've, I've, we're, we're just gonna wait a couple of minutes to let people uh, jump into the Zoom in case they're running a minute late and then we'll get started. Okay, we're about three minutes in. So, Eric, you want to start us off? Sure, be happy to. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for participating in the FMC First Friday webinar series. My name is Eric Ham, and I'm a key customer manager here at FMC Professional Solutions for the Central United States. The FMC First Friday webinar series is part of the FMC True Champions Dynamic Rewards Program. You know, the pillars of this program are product rewards, you're rewarded for your FMC product purchases, business building solution, member exclusives, uh, where you get access to uh, promotions and things of that sort, industry commitment, is one of the other pillars. And that's perks like this first Friday webinar series with CEUs for selected states. If you've not signed up for FMC True Champions, please do so by going to www.fmctruechampions.com. I also wanna thank everyone for their participation in making the 25th anniversary of Talstar Professional uh, a huge success. Uh, our winner this year, our winner on the promotion, the grand prize winner of the F-150 truck was Blake Foster with All-American Pest Control in Nashville, Tennessee. And FMC wants to congratulate Blake and all of the winners uh, in the FMC promotion, Talstar promotion. Now I'd like to introduce Lou Sorkin, our speaker today. Uh, Lou's topic, bed bug control. For fun and profit. Uh, and here's a little information about Lou. Uh, Lou grew up in Westchester County, New York and Eastern Connecticut, where he always had a keen interest in animals, especially arthropods, reptiles, and amphibians. Uh, teachers invited him to bring his animals to teach the younger children in classes. Uh, he graduated with a master's in entomology from the University of Connecticut in 1978 and, and began his arachnological, ooh, that's an easy word to say on a Friday, <laughs> arachnological career in the Department of Entomology 
now the Division of Interbrate Invertebrate Zoology at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. He pursued his interest in spiders and other arachnids, especially certain parasitic species, and for the last 35 years, the common bed bug. In 2020, he retired from the museum after 43 years of service. Lou incorporated his entomology consulting business, Intsult Associates, in the year 2000. He is a board certified entomologist in urban and industrial entomology, specializing in forensic studies. I'd like to welcome Lou today, but first I'm going to hand this off to Ed to clean up some of the other particulars on our first Friday webinar. So Ed, there you go. Thanks, Eric. Great intro. I appreciate it. Um, just I'll be very brief. I just want to let you know how we do uh, the processing of your CEUs, because I know that's uh, very important. Um, number one, if there's anything that you have to do for your state, such as fill out a form or something like that, you will get an email with, uh, with that request from us asking you what needs to be done. We'll give you the form and we'll say, hey, please sign this and send it back to us. Uh, for the majority of the states, we will do it ourselves. Uh, many of the states don't require you to get involved on that. They just need us to follow up. So we will submit your information. After this webinar, uh, you will get a certificate within the next week or so from FMC. That is your kind of like your proof that you are here. Okay, that's your 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 proof of attendance. That is not your CEU or anything, but it is us um, giving proof that you did attend. Um, then we will follow up with the CEU process uh, as we normally do. Real quick, I will give you the recap on the states where we're offering CEUs today. It's quite a few, so I'll ramble through them real quick. Arizona, California, Colorado, Delaware, D uh, District of Columbia, Florida, Indiana, Maryland, Michigan, Montana, New Mexico, New York, Oklahoma, Oregon, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, Texas, Utah, West Virginia, and Washington. Um, last, lastly, um, if there are any problems, just email us. Every so often an email gets missed, uh, something doesn't go through, there's a, an incorrect uh, license number that maybe when you registered or whatnot, we always take care of it. So as long as you email it, don't, don't um, worry about it. Uh, we'll work with you and take care of it. Um, we're going to have a couple breaks that Lou will have during this. We're going to have to type into the chat. And then at the end, we'll have an online quiz that you're going to have to take. All of this is to kind of prove that you're uh, interacting in this webinar. So uh, with that, I'll hand it off to Lou. Uh, for the fun and profit of bed bugs. <laughs> oh, thanks very much, Ed. Uh, here's a, a few of the questions, and thanks for inviting me to speak. I did change the title a bit and took out the word control, I guess. Um, since I don't work in control of them, I work in fun and profit and uh, consulting work in it. Um, I'll start. Let me know if it doesn't work here. Uh, just a few pictures of different size bed bugs on my fingers. Uh, I, these were used in some publications, um, some of which I'll, I'll show a few pictures of during the presentation. Uh, one of the early pre um, publications on bed bugs uh, in the real estate section of the New York Times was this particular story that was being done uh, back in, I think, 2006. To, to let everyone know more about bed bugs. And uh, there was a few of the AM New York ones about bed bugs and how it was taking people by surprise um, just because it was an insect that wasn't really or hadn't been around for a really long, really long time. And people weren't aware of this. So the uh, issue was not being aware, so not knowing what to do not to get bed bugs and not knowing what to do if you had bed bugs. 
Uh, of course, there were many attorneys got involved with bed bug issues. And I've worked on a few cases of, of plaintiffs, plaintiffs and defense uh, on bed bug issues in apartments, in hotels, especially hotels, because that was one of the first places uh, that bed bugs seemed to be picked up. And uh, of course, people at hotels, the people working there, really didn't know too much about bed bugs either. Uh, the employees would, you know, move furniture, move uh, bedding from one place to another, not realizing you may be moving bed bug infestation from one place to another. But back to the one on the New York Times, uh, I had them insert this circle showing the relative sizes of bed bugs because most people um, didn't really understand what a bed bug looks like. And of course, the uh, bed bug looks very different if you're looking at an adult or looking at an immature or nymph, of which there are five instars of bed bug. And then uh, there were certain um, publications who were writing about blood, uh, blood feeding animals. Uh, my uh, friend Bill on the, the right side book, uh, Dark Banquet, um, we included one chapter, he included one chapter on me about bed bugs. He has worked mainly as vampire bats. And the other publication uh, was also uh, different reporters came in to talk to me about bed bugs. And uh, since I raised bed bugs, starting with Harold Harlan's strain that he sent me, a, of which he sent me a jar um, back in the late um, 1990s. Um, so I, I uh, thought I'd start raising them just to see what they were because I knew about them from entomology, but I never saw a live one before. So I, I fed um, about 50 to 100 bed bugs on my arm, which I'll have pictures of too. And I was interested in that. I really didn't itch at all from feeding them. I just had a, a, a reaction to having all this bed bug saliva in me and just a swelling and a redness. And I'll have pictures of that, plus some other sequelae that followed from feeding bed bugs, but not really itchiness at all. Um, certain books um, that were in libraries many, many years ago, and these were from England, uh, the pest control companies would stamp the information on the edges of the books because people took books out from libraries and it was like free uh, advertising that way. And uh, that way, you know, something usually happened if people had books in their homes brought back and forth to the library, and you had bed bugs, you were not transferring bed bugs back and forth from the library to your home. Unless, uh, and in many cases, the um, librarians didn't realize this and didn't treat properly, except that they looked on the side of the book, they know who to call to help them out. And there were even postcards. Hopefully the uh, postcard picture on the right was not the wedding night for these, uh, this couple here. Gave them something else to do, I guess. Um, and now at times there's many um, publications, postcards, uh, pictures and uh, things about bed bugs. So this was a t-shirt um, that my daughter sent me or a friend of mine sent me actually um, on using a bed bug. Not a very good picture, but actually I do know at 3 a.m. where all my bed bugs are and they're in jars and vials, luckily, and not just roaming the house. And, and back uh, in this um, publication, someone else came to talk to me in 2009 about bed bugs. And uh, I'd always show them the live ones that I kept there. Now I have them all home. So I have about five to 10,000 at home. The, the museum, I had a, a few thousand of them in jars, not as many as I do now. And the museum did have a long time ago an exhibit on uh, parasitic insects. And there was a wax model of a bed bug, which I'm still looking for. I don't know what happened to this model. A, a little bit on the biology. Uh, since it's a good thing to go over. Um, a bed bug is a true bug, which means it has a segmented proboscis and paired stylets. 
within that proboscis. And that the paired style it's, is called the style at fascicle. And that fascicle is what goes in piercing the skin. The uh, labium, which I have uh, pictures of later, uh, that's the part that stays outside the skin and folds back out of the way when the stylets are going in. Uh, the, uh, in natural conditions, these bed bugs, the bugs of the family simicity, feed only on warm blooded animals, so that's mammals and birds. Um, they attach their small eggs to surfaces. There's a little um, adhesive on there, and that's why they stay where they're placed by the female bed bug. And as I mentioned earlier, there are five different instars or stages of the nymph in the life cycle of a bed bug. And each requires at least one proper blood meal. If there's only small amounts, then that nymph will feed more than one time in order to get enough nutrition that allows it to shed its skin and continue to the next stage of development. Under certain conditions of let's say 75 to 80% relative humidity and higher temperatures, uh, mid to uh, low 90s degree Fahrenheit, the life cycle can go as quickly as in four to five weeks. That's from egg till the next egg produced by that next generation of adults. The female can lay 200 to 400 eggs in her lifetime, which runs from months to a year. That's all temperature and humidity dependent. And in some lab populations, a female will, given ideal conditions of lots of blood and matings to occur, she can produce around 500 eggs. The fed adults, and I've had these, live more than a year without feeding. Um, if they haven't fed and you're keeping them, of course, they're going to die earlier. And if it's a very dry conditions, they'll also die faster. Uh, the nymphs and adults have no problem surviving three to four months and six months or more. And I keep the bed bugs I keep here, and I have photographs of all those too, um, in containers. And they're on my ground floor office, which I try to keep in the low 60s. So most of this time they're very cool so they'll last longer without feeding because I don't feed them you know every uh, few weeks I wait maybe uh, sometimes a few months in between feedings the uh, and mating as everyone knows is traumatic insemination it is a physical trauma not a psychological trauma which some people feel the bugs uh, worry that they're going to be mated and the females run away from the harborage areas, which doesn't really happen like that. Um, many are nocturnal harboring clusters. They're using uh, different pheromones and chemicals that are, that are produced that keep these insects near each other. And there are also certain pheromones that are produced that may make more bed bugs scatter if there's an alarm pheromone. And as you all know, uh, they're hiding most of the time during the daytime. Unless you have a very heavy infestation, they'll be out. And if you walk into an area where all of these bugs are hiding and you don't see much, the more you stay there and keep exhaling carbon dioxide, you're going to have many more bugs waking up, quote unquote, and trying to see where is all this carbon dioxide from because that's my potential host right there. And uh, our Common bed bug, Simex lectularius, prefers humans, but almost any warm blooded animal will do. The uh, Simex hemipterus, the tropical bed bug, is a similar, same way. And people have bird bugs and bat bugs may be fed upon by those insects, but sometimes certain populations or certain individuals really don't like people, even though they may be hungry, they may not bother feeding on you at all. Uh, and, and often the bed bugs, the smaller bed bugs takes less time than an older bed bug to fully engorge on the blood meal and then crawl off and go somewhere else to digest it. And in the digesting process, you know, where they're all staying, they're also mating will occur in there too. And there's interaction between bed bugs of all sizes. They can feed, travel 15 to 20 feet or more to find a host and pick up on the CO2 and follow that. 
Uh, they may feed every few days if hosts are there. And from a medical standpoint, sometimes and, and actually rarely does a bed bug void its previous or current meal while it's feeding or recently finished until very unless very full. So they're not good vectors, let's say, as a try to mine red aviid bugs are for trypanosomiasis, because they're really not making the host itch when they feed, and they're not defecating where they feed, unlike the good vectors for that disease of those tritome, tritomine red aviids. And related tritomine red aviids aren't good vectors for that same, for those same reasons. And they can remain fully active at 45 degrees if acclimated for at least 24 hours at around 60. But normally in most cases, they're inactive at those lower, lower, much lower temperatures. And reasons why bed bugs are increasing, people, like I said earlier, aren't aware of the problem. Public education is lacking. And that was many years ago. There's a lot more education, a lot more internet information, some of it not so good. Um, I, I've worked with many of the pest management professionals and some uh, don't understand bed bugs and they actually do a lot more treatment on other insects or other pests. And there are certain pest control companies that really specialize in bed bugs. We have to really know more about bed bug biology and behavior to, to know what to do in an infestation uh, issue. Uh, sometimes, the homeowner doesn't adequately prepare prior. And in some companies, they really don't want the homeowner to do anything and they'll do the work because the more the homeowner does, the more you might start making a bed bug population start scattering. And one of the other reasons is increasing. Many years ago, baits were used for a lot of the insect pests and bed bugs wouldn't of course go after those baits at all. And a lot of uh, issues, I, I worked with Wood Green Community Services and they uh, had this little poster up for people living on their properties because uh, often people thought they were dirty, they themselves, and didn't want to say anything about having bed bugs. Um, but it here is telling you in order to really get rid of them, we have to work together on it. So the order Hemiptera is the order in which bed bugs are classified. The order Homoptera, which includes some of these groups, is an order that doesn't exist any longer. Everything is Hemiptera now. And I have a few pictures and life cycle area, um, displays of bed bugs, just so you can see what's on the internet and what errors have been made and what people are reading to learn about bed bugs, which might not be correct at all. Uh, this one's pretty good from Steve Doggett out in Australia uh, to show uh, bed bugs in feeding and non-feeding um, position and stance um, and appearance. And some of those pictures have been taken from that and used, if you'll realize here, the person making up this design left out one end star. So it's not quite right. They trimmed out the bugs and left the antenna or distal sections of the antenna off too. Another issue with that one. This one's another one from Steve. Nice photographs of uh, bed bugs that haven't fed or actually aren't, haven't fed recently, but had fed at one uh, in that instar of the life. Uh, adult bed bugs uh, are, aren't. Um, don't use the term instar to refer to the adult stage. Uh, another one here showing some that are uh, not recently fed, but ones that you could come across and explaining that these are nymphs because bed bugs are hemimetabolous. There's no larval stage, but it's an immature stage. Uh, also, this one's pretty good. It shows a comparison of fed and unfed bed, bed bug uh, nymphs and adults and the eggs. And a comparison with a coin, people will see relative sizes. Uh, this one's talking about larva, which is now wrong. And there's a mixture of fed and unfed nymphs and adults uh, in this. So it's confusing to people what bed bugs might look like. And here's a composite life cycles using um, 
pictures from other pictures that were found on the internet and the size uh, issue of centimeters, which they really meant 0.6 centimeters. It's, that was an enormous bed bug. And here's one of the worst because it's showing, it's talking about larva, but it's also showing you dark renditions of bed bugs and the larva, I mean, and the immature stage really isn't a tiny dark miniature adult stage. The, the immatures look different from the adults uh, due to their cuticle, which is not hardened and formed like an adult. It's the immature cuticle, which is more clear and uh, white colored in, in the first in stage, first in star um, nymph. And this is taken from the previous one, another bad one. And this interesting photograph uh, showing a feeding bed bug, but I uh, emailed the photographer who I know and said, you didn't take out the human hair from that bed bug. So I know people have been looking at this thinking the hair is actually part of the feeding mechanism. So that was fixed. And another comparison, uh, bed bugs and apple seeds, it depends on the, the variety of apple uh, because you can see these seeds of an apple are way bigger than the adult bed bugs that I positioned next to all these apple seeds. The uh, bed bug right here, I guess you can see me pointing to it, is in a cleaning pose. It's not in a praying pose, worried that the heavy mass above it is not a male bed bug. Uh, this from Jody Green, Nebraska Extension, uh, was, is quite good in showing different things, seeds that that people might find in their home and comparing it to the relative size of bed bugs. And I have male and female in a nymph to show the relative coloration and uh, size of first versus, um, except of course the first here is magnified a bit, but it shows the, the uh, less sclerotization that occurs and more membrane on the abdominal and thoracic segments. And there's even a suture mark, which I think I might have pictures later on the thorax and head of a nymph bed bug. That's where the shed skin, the skin itself will open at the suture area to allow that next individual, next instar or adult to come out of. The traumatic insemination, uh, pictures from Richard Naylor over in England shows a top view. So the male is always on this position for mating a female and underneath because the ectospermal liege, which is the um, area in which the external area in which the male puts his paramere and adiagus in is on this section of the female. And between different species of bed bugs, the position and morphology of these structures, of course, is different. That allows us to identify them too. I was um, feeding a bed bug, bed bug couple on me here. And because they were on the skin and not in a harborage area, they decided they didn't really want to mate and they'd rather eat instead. So they went out to dinner. This um, couple here, is uh, mating and she's having trouble going up this slippery metal uh, section of a paintbrush, artist paintbrush. But, and I'll go into this later, you'll see when the male lets go, she has no trouble crawling up this metal ferrule. And um, early on years ago, back in the eighties, nineties and so, and I think even further along, uh, there was always the information out there about bed bugs can't climb smooth surfaces when in fact they, they really can. They're not using the tarsal claws on smooth surfaces and I'll show that later. Uh, I had a few adult bed bugs. This is a quarter inch graph paper. So you can see droppings, you can see the bed bugs there and a mating couple with another male below. And he decides to crawl up on a pile and sit up there, which then ruined the mood of the bed bugs underneath and they decided we'll just hang out here instead and no mating occurred. Uh, here, the um, eggs, there's egg shells and there's droppings and there's metabolic waste. So with bed bugs, you have dark droppings and it depends on the 
surface upon which these are placed when defecating, if they're absorbed into the surface or just boil up and dry, the light areas, that's the metabolic waste. And by breaking down their proteins in the blood, they produce uric acid, which is this light colored material. And uh, this here shows a bed bug on the top left depositing an egg. Uh, shows the uh, nymph, first instar nymph, out of an egg, an eggshell next to it. And the other close up, which I have a better one in a little while, uh, showing the red eye of the bed bug and the cap of the egg from which this bed bug comes out. And here's a good shot of it. And you could see the adhesive uh, in Steve Doggett's picture. Uh, that the female has added to the egg when she's depositing it. This here shows a bed bug hatching out. So you see the cover is popped off. The bed bug is supposed to gulp in a bit air. And then because it's all soft, it's not a hardened body at all. In this point of its life, it's able to gulp and push and change its shape to get out of the eggshell itself. And you'll find either in infestations, you'll find eggs that are like this uh, or egg shells with covers popped off. And I kept some bed bugs here in a little box. And it's interesting, even though they were in this little like one inch by one and a half inch plastic box, they didn't all stay together. And we don't know the reasons why these bed bugs stayed in different parts of that box. Were they repelled by other bed bugs? They just liked where they were, it's hard to say. Uh, here's the uh, uh, female bed bug, it shows an egg, it shows the metabolic waste next behind this female. Uh, it shows a male here and they were in the, she didn't, and he, both of them didn't stay together the whole time. The female stayed in one place with her egg she deposited and the male just walked around and came in once in a while to say hello. Uh, the bugs you can see up here, the uh, darker, nymph is just about an hour older than those pale white ones that have just hatched from the eggs. And here in the same quarter inch square graph paper, you can see the first instar unfed and fed condition. Here's a molting bed bugs. And in the, uh, this is an adult, newly emerged adult, both of them are. And um, you see the shed skin has come off, but stuck on a bed bug that's about an hour older from molting than the one below, which is all still all white. And you'll notice there's still the food, the blood from me uh, being digested in its gut. So just the exoskeleton, which is the ectodermal derivative, uh, goes when it, the insect molts. You see though, it's still stuck on the abdomen. And sometimes when that's stuck, what happens And these two females show the anomaly in the abdomen because the shed skin was stuck there too long before it came off. And the uh, tanning process in the integument started and continued, and now it has a deformed abdomen. Here's a shed skin, and by darkening, changing contrast and brightness, you get a better view of it. The three dark areas on the abdomen here, because this is the fifth instar shed skin, this is the receptacles for the glands because there's three abdominal glands in the nymph stage. The adult bed bug doesn't have abdominal glands like that. They have glands that are in the thorax instead with evaporative areas in that air, in the, on the thorax. So when the glandular secretion comes out, it has a nice wide open space for it to, to fill, which allows better dissipation of uh, that secretion to um, sort of contact the bugs that would be in a harborage area in, in most cases. And I'm using different lighting here just to see the bed bugs. White light, you know, is obvious. The uh, ultraviolet on the ventral area of this uh, adult bed bug, you can see it's a brighter ventral re rectangle. And that area on the bed bug adult is actually membranous on a bed bug. So if you ever get insects sent to you, people thinking they're adult bed bugs, if you look at the ventral view of that, if it looks like this and it's softer, it's a membranous area, then it is the abdomen plus some of the other structures you'll look at. 
you can identify it as opposed to let's say um, ladybird beetles, which sometimes people will find and thinking that's a bed bug abdomen. Um, and the infrared lighting clears that insect right away and you look right inside. Here's a scanning electron micrograph of bed bugs showing the ventral view, showing the males of the paramere, which is the hook and the adiagus, uh, which is another thinner membranous structure inside through which the sperm is ejaculated into the female abdominal cavity. Um, this is showing different antenna, antennal morphology of various submissive bugs. So even though all bed bugs may look alike, and that's the mistake, if people misidentify a non simex lectularius or simex hemipterus, if you're in Florida or other areas, or if you have bat bugs or bird bugs, you're going to treat for bed bugs, which would be all wrong because you're not getting rid of the actual issue. And the bugs are from someplace else, just crawling into where people are, not staying where people are. But you see that the different four antenna mirrors, the four antennal segments can vary in shape and size, thickness, and hairiness. And a close up of the tips of bed bug antenna, those little sensilla that are uh, listed here, letter and numbers, uh, pick up different materials and then your uh, bed bug reacts, picking up if they pick up those particular materials that leads to a different behavior. Uh, an under, a ventral view showing the mouth part of the bed bug, uh, legs are attached, the uh, eyes, compound eyes and antenna, a colorized view. And when these are always um, dried properly for SEM work, the uh, stylets always pop out of the labium and it's in an unnatural position, as you can see here too. The uh, labium, which is the heavy section, is articulated and that is folded up out of the way when this bed bug is feeding. Also the tarsi are different on bed bugs, different bed bug species, the adult has three segmented tarsi, the uh, nymph stages are two segmented. And you could see different sets of brushes and combs and things on their legs. Uh, and here, this is leg three, you can see the spine here, which is a heavy comb and the uh, fascia spongiosa, which is a wrist pad. And that's important for climbing smooth surfaces. So this colorized view of the first leg shows that comb is fine. And um, the claws here, you can see. And here's a bed bug I'm holding and not, it's not dead, I'm not squeezing it, but it's holding onto paper. It's lifting just with its claws. It's not letting go of paper, droppings, other bugs that are in here. So it supports much more than its weight in holding on with those claws. The uh, early presentations about bed bugs showing a cockroach versus a uh, bed bug tarsus uh, shows the pads on the cockroach leg so it's able to hold on to smooth surfaces. The, uh, on, in, by, by in error though, uh, showing here the claws and no pads on the tarsus of a bed bug adult, um, it's, they were saying you can't, these can't climb smooth surfaces, but Remember that fascia spongiosa I pointed to earlier. Here it is on this particular leg of a bed bug. And this bed bug crawling on plastic and these, these hollowed blue arrows are pointing to that fascia spongiosa holding on. And if we look at this bed bug a nail here, it's crawling up glass and it's even able to make a turn, turn around and grab onto plastic up a smooth surface because of the wrist pads. And this bed bug, uh, when bothered as it's crawling, simply stops in its tracks. When it stopped banging that forceps on the metal cover, it continues walking again. And here, this is a deformed female, as you know from previous slides about its rear end. Let me, this one here. 
oh, sorry about the flip, but it's having trouble walking on plastic. It can't grip. It's a very smooth surface. Even the fascia spongiosa doesn't work well. And this bed bug is writing itself. It has to arch its back in order to flip and turn itself over from this smooth surface. So that's how it does it. And in this photograph, you can see uh, a bed bug male in a normal flattened position, but bed bugs uh, have different behaviors. So this one's actually up in the air, surveying and picking up something. It might be whoever is breathing, maybe it's picked up on the CO2. This bed bug here is uh, cleaning its proboscis and you could see that cleaning system going on here. Hi, Ed, I know I have something to throw up there and it's coming along here soon. Hey, yeah, Lou, sorry, yeah. I just wanted to make sure you knew um, we've got about 20 some minutes left Okay. Uh, in the webinar. So, I mean, if you want, we can have them type something in right now and you can skip past that slide so that you can keep going. Uh, all right, I'm just showing here, I might as well show that they're actually interested in this damp uh, paper towel. And um, that may, because they do need moisture and they're really actively searching into this paper towel. So what's in, and if you watch this, I'll do it in a second. If you watch this, this bed bug's really interested in the material. Now, if you were to use a dampness or this kind of structure, and have it sprayed with a non-repellent chemical, they're actually very curious and interested in the substrate. And it would stay longer and allow it to have more time to pick up an active ingredient, giving it something to play with. I even tried um, this material for crickets and just to see if they were attracted to moisture, they didn't really care much for it, but this uh, bed bug was able to crawl on this wet material, except when it flipped over because it had a larger surface area, it couldn't get its body off of this damp, wet material. Um, this is just um, on submissives. Are there questions that you want me to look at? Uh, you know, well, first of all, we want to make sure um, since we've gone over just a little bit, I want to make yeah. sure that everybody goes into the chat room, uh, to room, the little chat box right. and type in a code. Uh, well, right now, let's just, uh, let's just say the code is bed bug. So I just oh. typed it in. If everyone else will go in and do the exact same thing. Thank you. You're doing a great job. Um, and then we do have some questions. I'll ask you while they're doing that. Um, Ted, uh, asked if a vertical surface such as bed footings is sprayed with Teflon, would such application deter the bed bugs from climbing upwards? Yeah, I, I never tried that, but I know sometimes a smooth surface is very different from a slippery surface. So it may be smooth and may misinterpret as being slippery at the same time. But I've, I've noticed if you have a surface that look smooth, but might be comprised of very fine um, surface broken up by air space, then that bug can't get a good grip, even with its wrist pad, and will slip off. And as you saw that slippery plastic cap surface, also the bed bug slipped, it couldn't get a good grip on it. So certain things, and maybe Great. Teflon might work like that too. I'm just not sure. I never tested it. Gotcha. Okay, so in the interest of time, I'm going to hold the rest of the questions because we got 15 minutes. So okay. you can go on with the rest of your presentation. And then when we're taking the quiz, we can do all the questions then. Okay. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, this is just sure. a um, the family simicity showing you the relative sizes of bed bugs in there. The uh, common bed bug on the right the one in Africa feeds on people and in, in, in huts is on the left. Those are adults. And this Primisimex is enormous and it feeds on uh, only one bat species, just to show you the variation in size. 
Uh, and when this feeds, if you read this, it actually touches the bat, grabs it. It's almost like a predator feeding on that bat when it does it. Uh, and these have been online uh, sh showing you a fed and unfed bed bug when in fact it's really two species of bed bugs and not one. The common one on the left and the tropical on the right. You can see differences in the pronotum on these bugs. The males are different. Also pronotal differences are very obvious. Uh, you might come across bat bugs. Here's a attic I was in showing you the morphology of a bat bug, how much more hairy it is compared to a bed bug, a female and a male. Uh, these are bird bugs, which are very different from the common bed bug. But if you find them, uh, don't treat for bed bugs. You have to go find where are these bed bugs living and you have to get rid of them from the original host area. And these are anthocorid bugs. Some people have been bitten by these and misidentify the bugs themselves as being bed bugs. And they're not. And you can see the anthocorids compared to uh, first instar bed bugs here. These are predaceous little tiny bugs and they're also plant bugs that are not predaceous. They're feeding on plants, but I've had them on me and they'll feed and not just bite and leave. So it's very interesting. Here's another anthocorid showing you the nymph stage, showing you a demarcation, which is similar to a bed bug nymph and having a line down the back, because this is where it's going to open up when it sheds and the lines on the head, but it has also wing buds there and bed bug nymphs don't have those at all. And more pictures of the anthocorids is in UV light infrared, which is clears it and the first instar true bed bugs, even the pentatomid bugs, those dark red and with black in them, that's the bug on the right, the uh, bed bug on the left. And you might find other insects and in, in shed skins in homes. Uh, this odd beetle uh, is the female on the left is often misidentified as being a bed bug nymph, which of course it isn't. The uh, male bed bug knows it's not, so it will mate with the female odd beetle. The spider beetles showing this common Gibium equinoctiale, which is a shiny uh, one. You can see a cut I made and a vent, uh, sort of a lateral view, a longitudinal section showing you the structures of that bug. There's no wings inside, just a hardened outer wing covers are fused. And carpet beetles, black carpet beetles. This is a picture of bed bugs compared to the uh, some of the common ladybird beetles that might be found. Uh, this was a reason, like I explained earlier about bed bugs, the early times in hotels where the workers didn't understand and would mix fresh and older uh, sheets and things together, transferring bugs. Sometimes in hotels, you'll have bugs living on the, the, um, under the straps of the suitcase covers. Some company designed this plastic insert where you can put it in your clothing in and carry it in your suitcase and then take this and place the whole thing into a drawer. Uh, different hotel uh, rooms showing you where bed bugs and because of the structure of the bed of the hotel where they live very easily out of the way behind headboards with your anchored to walls in most cases or under the support structure of a mattress. Here's one I had in Las Vegas. Uh, where the bed bugs, I noticed powder had been used in my room and they were actually living in the motorized curtains in that hotel room. And they didn't realize it because they didn't go in when the curtains were down or up. They just, wherever they were, the people cleaned around the bed and treated around the bed, but they were living in that. Other places where bed bugs will be in, in some hotels or dorm rooms or other hostel type situations, that's H-O-S-T-E-L. And in New York, there were also uh, clothing and sneakers and things were bought. People had bed bugs at home. They returned the stuff to the store. The store didn't realize that people had the bed bugs. Maybe the people didn't either. And now they transferred it to the stores. And in theaters, they lived uh, under in these little apartment circles um, for bed bugs condominiums under a seat. And there were also different actresses and actors had really jumped on the bandwagon with bed bugs 
and traumatic insemination. So here Isabella Rossellini was doing this in one of her presentations. Uh, I attended and, and worked with the people uh, for this Bed Bugs musical that opened in New York City off Broadway. And then there was also a, a woman, a playwright who'd come to the museum and I didn't realize she was a playwright and what she was doing, but her um, uh, entomologist love story was actually something that had me in this play. And I never did get to see it. I had friends who had gone there, but I never got to see it. Uh, and this was the group who were in that play. Yeah, this was in San Francisco, I believe. And the uh, people at the Cal Academy gave them entomological advice on how to set up the stage and, and speak entomology to one another. This was in um, the city, in many cities, and this is how many of the bed bugs were transferred just by people picking up used mattresses, which everyone knows here, furniture, and then finally people um, listed do not take bed bugs. So people took the, uh, well, of course, people didn't take the bed bugs off and take the furniture. They just left that where it was. And uh, even in New York, we had one bedroom, one bathroom. So you had bed bugs living in bathrooms and bed and bedroom at the same time. Uh, spiders in place, bed bugs in some high infestations will go up higher. It's not a different species of bed bug, but if it's really crowded, they go up and find less crowded areas too. Uh, you'll see them on ceilings. You'll see them in um, the uh, hanging, um, moldings. I had these bed bugs crawled off of the suitcase that were in a, in a closet and crawled along and stayed on the molding and then crawled down to feed on people below in the bed and then crawled back up, never stayed in the bed area. Uh, this is the code word, which we already did one. And some infestations of bed bugs, just go over some pictures showing you some behind pictures, showing you some photographs of where some of the heavy infestations might be a heat riser uh, inside a fixture on a chandelier, inside a smoke alarm, some of the electrical systems and holes drilled for wiring allows very easy access for bed bugs to move between apartments, rooms, and so forth. Behind electric switches and plates, along the edges of rooms, uh, saddles behind uh, the vinyl, uh, floor edgings here. You can see they didn't get past where the glue was. They just stayed in the open curved over spot in the corner of the room. And this person had them in her kitchen. Uh, she didn't stay in her bedroom, but she had them in her kitchen and her living room. And these were crawling around the books and the tabletop countertops. And she had a lot of things around, a little crowded. So they were within all the mail. They were within papers. Uh, they were in stored in areas where she stored things. And I know a lot of you have seen this scenario before. Uh, clothing, she would wash clothing because she saw bed bugs, but not realize they were living everywhere else in her place. She had layers of fabric, uh, garments, blankets, quilts, where she stayed on the couch. And by moving these layers out, you can see many areas in which bed bugs proliferated to enormous numbers. She even had a uh, portable potty in the living room and they were living under the arms of that potty. The, and you'll see here the behavior of the bed bugs. They didn't like the napped section of the towel. They liked the smooth area. It was almost like if you gave them these areas like runways, they would walk from one place to another just staying on this. So that's something else that may be useful in treating them is giving them places to play in, giving them places to walk on, giving them smooth surfaces, bolded surfaces. All of these areas are great monitor devices. It's just that they're very difficult to examine. That's the reason why there are monitor devices made so you can easily examine them and look at them. In this particular place, uh, this person had thousands and thousands of books, had carpet beetles feeding on some of the dust and organic material, had this, he slept with his book. So he had bed bugs living within the books, living in the bed, living on top of books. All these were sent out for vicane fumigation. They were 
40,000 volumes of books here. And then when it was empty, proper treatment could be done. And he even had a chair, as you'll notice this, uh, his chair had bed bugs living under the cloth flaps. You could see the dark fecal marks, the lighter um, metabolic waste. You could see empty eggshells here, this shed skin and a bed bug fifth instar there on a couch, eggs. I just put tape there to pull the eggs out to get a good view, spider webs, had dead bed bugs. The white and dark material is spider droppings and bed bugs will go in, as you know, in creeks, cracks and crevices. Here, the bed bugs stayed only on the right side in this plastic chair and the recessed screw hole because clothes were left on this side, clothes were not left on the left side of the chair. And on furniture, bed bugs were living here, bed bugs and German cockroaches living together on this CD uh, shelf, uh, different wooden furniture made by people uh, because of smaller Manhattan apartments. Um, but all these areas are where bed bugs would stay. You can see the bugs here, the drop markings, uh, pointing to the metabolic waste, eggshells are there. Just these are different places. I'm sure you know and have seen uh, infestations, rolled cloth. So if a sheet is too big or your mattress encasement is too big and it has rolls in it and sleeves and crevices, that's a monitor area to look for bed bugs but you really don't want it to be that way on, on a, um, a bed. You want it to be smooth so you don't have them staying on, on the bed like that. Even on bed frames here, a friend of mine in Italy sent me, because this is a metal frame, people said bed bugs don't like metal frames. Well, these bed bugs don't read, they like metal frames too. And this, is an infestation of a headboard and furniture because the women who lived here went out and collected lots of wood to refinish and we brought lots of bed bugs home. And you could see areas where these bed bugs stayed, the waste, the metabolic waste, eggshells, uh, bed bugs in cracks and crevices on the headboard all around. You some fed because they fed on the women who were sleeping there. And then some females, you know, had uh, little areas where they were by themselves and later their young would stay there uh, too and that would be another center of infestation in the near future. These uh, are other areas where bed bugs under the uh, would be staying under the springs box spring area under a flap lift the flap bed bugs did really well under there you wouldn't know it just to look at it and in this frame and on the pillowcase and then folded fabrics. There's a lot of places where these bed bugs will stay. And these like just the area in between the top and bottom of the edge of this mattress here and a few other places. And this place, uh, the bed bugs were found in the apartment straight ahead, but the, and they were in her kitchen. The big problem were bed bugs in the next door apartment. And you could see here, all this material, bed bugs, when I walked in by me exhaling, they became very active. They were everywhere. This person would collect mattresses because he liked more mattresses and bring them inside. All this dark material in his bathroom was bed bug residue. It had nothing to do with roaches living. His apartment was a bit cluttered and lots of places for bed bugs to stay. On the clothing, when I walked by, they started coming out and they were on different areas of his mattress. You can see uh, the chip, paint chip on the wall. You can see the pictures here of different stages of bed bugs living all over the mattress and box spring. Another one with a slipper and they stayed in the crevice area from the heel to the sole because that was the positioning that was open underneath. Even the person was left-handed, he didn't use a right side. So the left side had no bed bugs in this pull up, but the right side did. And here is a picture someone sent me uh, from England where bed bugs lived on a person. This indigent person had an overgrowth of toenail. So they were living on the toenail. And uh, let me add quickly run through some shots here of um, where they're raised at home. And you can see the bed bugs in the vials being raised that way. Um, 
here in jars, some fed, some unfed. I just take the jars and turn them over on my arm. So it was a few thousand feet at that point. And the activity of bed bugs when the covers are off, shed skins, uh, feeding. This is a cover I took off. And here the bed bug stayed for a few minutes, even though I wasn't there on the other side anymore, but the heat from my arm kept that area warm for a little bit of time and they were still trying to feed on me, but I wasn't there anymore. And this just came out this week. Um, sorry, it's double print, but these bed bugs, what they found out is the certain chemicals produced by people attract bed bug, which we know, but the triglycerides are a non-arrestant. Uh, so the bed bugs will not stay and they do leave. That's why they leave people and go to areas um, where their harborage is rather than staying on people to rest and digest over time. So just a few pictures of raising a feeding mechanism in bed bugs. Uh, one defecating at Rich Naylor got a shot on a person. I used a uh, phenolphthalein hydrogen peroxide presumptive blood test. And yes, that the feces on my arm did turn pink and we knew it would, but it shows that it works. And bed bugs feeding by holding on to structure, not on the surface of the skin itself. So what happens here is bed bugs will feed and that's why you'll have, in, in fact, these, I took their legs off of me so they were stuck with their stylets in my skin hanging, but still holding on to one another and feeding. And you could see the bed bugs here are fed males and females pointing to the structures. The problem with the, uh, unfortunately, the uh, National Pest Management Association poster is that the adult male is actually an adult female that just fed, not a male. And this bed bug is moving through my hair on my arm so even though my skin is all available to it, it doesn't want to feed, except it finally finds a place and it pushes bulldogging right through. All this doesn't crawl on top. It's going right through between all the, the hairs on my arm. And then it finally comes to one place and starts feeding. So it, it, something, it attracted it, showing some other pictures of bed bugs first in stars, what they look like when they fed and these bed bugs have fed, but you'll notice that the blood that they've taken is now came out of their digestive system and it's in their body itself. And I don't know why it leaks in certain bed bugs, but over time they're digesting the extra storage capacity that they have now of blood to feed on. Hey Lewis, uh, I gotta interrupt you, I apologize. Oh, it's okay. We're, we're at, we're at, we're at our time end. and I want, I want to, I want to make I know I want to make sure you have time for the Q and A. So okay. for sure. every for everybody that that is here, uh, we have the quiz that you need to take. If you would please just click on it right now. I just posted this it is the, twice in the chat. Here's the code word here for uh, that was uh, the second one. Well, we're unless you have a different. Yeah, one. that was like. No, we don't need a code word because because we're at the we're at the the end of the webinar. Okay. Uh, what we need is people to take the quiz on Survey Monkey. There's a link there, and um, so right right now, Eric, if you can come on, you can go over the Q and A. Sure. And Ed. after people go ahead and take the quiz while you're doing this, that that then you know that officially. You've been here for the webinar, and if you need to drop off during the Q&A, that's fine. Just please make sure you take the quiz while we're doing the Q&A. Okay, over to you, Eric. Thanks, Ed. Uh, Lou, we've got a couple of good questions here. Uh, okay. First one, first one we're going to go for is, do bat bugs ever establish an infestation in homes, feeding on humans and reproducing? if they find their way into a home after the bats have been excluded? Uh, no, I, I've not heard of any populations being able to sustain on humans alone. They would leave a, a bat roost, feed on people, and then climb back and try to get back up to the roost. And I've never really seen them harbor 
in those same places like around the bed area where people have been. And they're not supposed to be able physiologically to sustain the population of bat bugs on human blood either. Okay. But they'll deal. still bite. They still bite until maybe they die. Uh, so sure. there's still going to be an issue which they have to be exterminated. Good deal. Okay. Next question. This was this is one that popped up. Okay. What features can help differentiate males and females besides size? Oh, oh it's the uh, structures of the, um, let's see. This here shows a female bed bug. And you'll notice the rear end of the bed bug is symmetrical on a female and asymmetrical on a male because the left side shows a male and it's that reproductive structure is on its last segment. And the segment before it actually is not symmetrical either. One side is wider and one side's narrower in bed bugs. Okay. Right. I don't know. I had somewhere else, I think, uh, male and female, but I'm not sure where it is in this whole. Well, yeah, I understand that one. Uh, can a female reproduce without mating with a male? No, I don't know of any cases of parthenogenesis genesis in bed bugs. Uh, how often can females lay eggs? So just, I think what we're getting at here is how long between each egg deposit? Ah, uh, deposit. Um, it probably would be a few weeks um, because they're laying eggs based on feeding and based on mating. So they can store sperm for a certain amount of time and they feed which then allows them to produce eggs and they'll continue to produce eggs and use the sperm to fertilize them until they're out of sperm okay. and they have to mate again. Good deal. Good deal. Uh, now we're going to kind of roll into some questions that people had on treatments. Okay. Okay. Uh, what's your best recommendation for treatment when someone has a lot of clutter, but can't clean up? Ah, well, one of the treatment methods of using Apprehend, which is a fungal-based treatment, has worked for many cases. You can have outside companies um, do cleaning because that's what some of them will just do. And then you can do treatment of if people really can't do it on their own. Right, right. Um, all right, what's some of your thoughts on heat treatment versus chemical treatment? Uh, if the heat treatment is done well, and I know some of the do-it-yourself people will do heat treatments. Uh, I've seen posts and I've seen <laughs> lots and lots of failures uh, with that. Um, the heat treatments, I've known uh, certain heat treatments, if only with heat, sometimes will, will, let's say, fail in apartments because you really can envelop one apartment itself to do heat very well compared if you were to do a smaller home let's say and do heat treatment right and in those cases uh, people will use a desiccant dust like semexa dust and put it into uh, wall sockets electric sockets and other open areas through which bed bugs can crawl from one room to another room and that way, when the heat is done, and if certain bugs are in an area where it doesn't get really hot enough, and they start crawling around, they may get in to another place. If they cross a, a barrier of a desiccant dust, they'll pick that up, and that will then kill them. Uh, okay. I think what they were getting, getting trying to get out there was... Uh -huh. uh, they're trying to, I think they're trying to elicit, is, is heat treatment a better way to go, or is it chemical treatment, or is it a combination? Uh, the combinations can work. It, 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 some of the chemical treatments, um, 
let's say in a regular infestation work and heat treatment is good i think if it's a very either a, a, sm a regular smaller infestation and you can really heat the rooms up at the right at the temperature high temperature at the right amount of time right uh, and that should get rid of it the the issue is if you're heating places but not doing a proper job so you're not heating to the right temperatures all of infestation areas or if you you have to move things around and readjust fans to make sure and have uh, temperature receptors out so you know what's going on so you get to the right temperature fast enough because when it gets up toward 100 the bed bugs and a little higher they're they're getting very active because it's getting too hot and they start crawling around um, and scattering uh, if it's if it's hot enough, they're not scattering that far because they're going to die. But if they're on the outskirts of the the heat treatment area, they're staying away from the heat and they're going further away away from the heat. And then later, they they can crawl back in after uh, a month or so many months, maybe two months or something after the heat treatment and get back in. So if you have the chemical used at the same time, which may also be in an adjoining room. <clears throat> then you're going to be getting rid of them as they start crawling about too. Wow, good good one on that one. I, I, we've got a couple more that popped in here. How long can hepatitis B be, be detected in bed bugs? Ooh, um, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know if I had a slide I think I had on that. Um, so it might be, I don't know, I'm really not sure. Um, it, it could go for digesting the blood, uh, maybe days, maybe weeks later. Uh, I'm not sure then if the titer is high enough, if it were transferred, but um, I, I'm not up on my hepatitis. I, I understand. Sorry. I understand. We can, we'll, we'll see if we can't dig something up on that one. Uh, okay. Got another one here. What about using steam? Now, this one, this, this one says the ones used by professional dry cleaners where the steam is directed to where the bed bugs are. And I do know that out in the field, we have some people using steam and steaming machines right. to treat around mattresses and things like that. What, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, the uh, steaming, um, I, I know I've worked with Pulte and their steamer gets up toward 300 degrees. And it's also a very dry steam, right. not moist at all, which is good. Um, and, and the um, speed at which you move the steam from one place along to the other is important because if you're going to move it like you're spraying, it's not long enough at a site to kill them. So you have to be close enough. And I know with a pulte, since it's very hot, you don't have to be as close as other steamers um, in order to get the temperature and hit them directly with it. If you have a steamer that gives you too much moisture, you're going to get too much moisture in that material you're steaming too, which right. may cause a, um, a mold condition, possibly uh, if it stays, in, let's say, in a mattress or a box spring and, and it's really wet. You don't want it to get wet. You want the heat. Uh, but a slow movement of uh, maybe moving a, a, a foot a second or even uh, less, actually, uh, than a foot um, is is like a few inches in a second would be enough to kill them. And people have done that. It's been very well um, used in killing bed bugs off using a steamer. Can, can you also, and, and from what I've heard uh, in the past is you also have an effect on the eggs that may be there. Is that Oh yeah, correct? the heat will kill them too, sure. Right, sure. okay, all right. Uh, hey, Eric, we, yes. we, we're gonna have to, to sign off here. Uh, okay. Why don't you give one last question? And uh, what we can do is, if we, if, uh, if we can, we'll try to answer any questions, you know, either via, via email with our follow up or social media or any of that kind of way. I, I tell you what, you wanna... Ed, I tell you what, Ed, there, some of these questions we're going to need to follow up with, and because they're pretty in depth. Uh, okay. And I don't want to get into that without, you know, with a time constraint that it is. So at this point, yeah. I'd just like to thank Lou for his 
his help and his participation in the first Friday uh, webinars. And uh, I thank think everybody we almost, for attending. <laughs> we almost called this first Friday and Saturday webinar. <laughs> <laughs> it went a little long on it. <laughs> uh, it's a it's a hot topic. So there you go. Yeah. So Ed, I'll let you wrap it up. Yeah. Well, um, again, thank you, Lou. Next time sure. we'll have to book you for a double session. <laughs> yeah. And, right. Uh, okay. <laughs> and and we appreciate everybody who's been on here. If there's any issues with your quiz or anything, like we said, when you get one of the FMC follow up emails, just just respond. We'll take care of you. Um, but I mean, I can see the majority of people have already taken the quiz and, and, um, I, I know we ran long, but it's a, it's a important topic. Um, so that's, that's why we did. So, uh, also the website where you registered, that's our website for registering every month. So if you want to go back there, you'll get a link from us, but, uh, probably the second week of January, we'll be doing our next webinar. And, and then after that, I'll go back to the literal first Friday of each month. So thanks again okay. to everyone and to Lou. And All right. uh, Thank you. everybody have a good rest of your day. Yes. Bye. Thanks a lot.